Our lecture today is on the cerebellum, which, as you'll see, overlaps a lot of what we've been doing in our three lectures on the brainstem. So here's a nice uh, drawing that a medical student did a couple of years ago for me. And um, I already did an overview of the cerebellum, but I think it would be worthwhile just going through this uh, one more time for the big picture. All right, so remember up here, we have these two pathways that travel down in parallel, the cortical spinal tract and the cortical pontocerebellar tract. So let's first follow the cortical spinal tract down. Remember, it goes through the posterior limb of the internal capsule, through the cerebral peduncle, through the basis pontus, crosses over at the pyramidal decussation to supply anterior horn cells on the opposite side of the spinal cord to move your opposite arm and leg. Okay, so that is then the um, uh, intended movement. Your brain wants to move a muscle or muscles here on the opposite side of your body. Now, every time that happens in parallel, the same signal um, is sent via the cortical pontocerebellar tract. So it travels right along with the cortical spinal tract. Remember, we pointed it out here in the cerebral peduncle, its location. But now it synapses on these pontine nuclei and then crosses over in the middle cerebellar peduncle. So remember, this is the only pathway that goes through the middle cerebellar peduncle, and this is a massive pathway. The middle cerebellar peduncle is huge, so this is all dedicated to informing your cerebellum about the intended movement. Okay, recall that the cerebellum is a comparator. It compares the intended movement, and now it needs to know the actual movement. And so when you are moving your arm and leg, muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs are activated. And so these travel right up through the spinal cord, same side, and tell the cerebellum basically what actually happened. Okay, now there always has to be an exception. And so we have this one pathway here, the ventral spinocerebellar tract, which crosses over in the spinal cord. And then it crosses over again here in the superior cerebellar peduncle, the end result is the same. Okay, so all the muscles here on this side of your body end up talking to the cerebellum on the same side. Okay, so now the cerebellum knows the intended movement, it knows the actual movement, and so some complex processing occurs. Okay, and obviously this is over simplistic here, but that then goes out through the superior cerebellar peduncle up through a nucleus of the thalamus, which uh, we'll discuss is mainly the VL of the thalamus, ventral lateral nucleus, and then back to the motor cortex. All of this happens instantaneously so that your motor cortex can precisely coordinate movement. So notice the cerebellum, um, it talks to upper motor neurons, like the motor cortex. We'll see that it also talks to upper motor neurons in the brainstem, but its effect on movement is indirect. Okay, we don't have upper motor neurons coming from the cerebellum. It kind of works with to coordinate um, with upper motor neurons. All right, so um, here is a drawing. Uh, sorry for the poor quality, but um, I just couldn't find one I like, so I created this one. If one of you wants to draw a nice rendition of this, um, I would love it. And so this just shows a couple of other things that weren't in the other diagram so we kind of get a big picture. First of all, it shows the deep cerebellar nuclei. So basically everything going in or out of the cerebellum has to go through these deep um, cerebellar nuclei. All right, so we still see the output here from the superior cerebellar peduncle, but this shows a couple of other circuits. Remember we have this connection between the red nucleus and the inferior olivary nucleus, and this is the via the central tegmental tract. Recall the lesion here, it gives the patient palatal myoclonus. Okay, but this is also a circuit here. We have, uh, I, I mentioned when we were going through the medulla, that the inferior olive is really a displaced cerebellar nucleus. Well, it's communicating with the cerebellum here through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Okay, and then this, we'll see, goes back out to the red nucleus. So we have this kind of a triangle here from red nucleus, inferior olive, cerebellum, and back to the red nucleus. That's why I said the red nucleus is important also in terms of cerebellar function. Okay, the one other thing here to point out um, here in this kind of overview, 
is that the vestibular nuclei, which you'll recall are you know, very involved in eye movements, the vestibulo-ocular reflex, okay, these communicate with the cerebellum back and forth here, and mainly this is through via the flocculonodular lobe, which is very important for eye movements. So we have this connection here kind of going back and forth from the vestibular nuclei to the flocculonodular lobe, and uh, this, as we'll discuss, goes through the uh, midline vestigial nucleus, which makes sense. The flocculonodular lobe is very midline. So all of this is really important for eye movements, okay? But uh, we also have these upper motor neuron pathways like the vestibulospinal tract, which are influenced um, here by the cerebellum. Okay, so on a sagittal section of the cerebellum here, we can see the anterior lobe, the large posterior lobe, and the primary fissure here. The flocculonodular lobe is midline, so we can't really um, uh, see that uh, very well here. We did see the flocculus kind of projecting, or I'm sorry, the nodulus projecting into the fourth ventricle on one of our brainstem slides. So in terms of function, the anterior lobe and the vermis, the vermis makes up a lot of the anterior lobe, these together are referred to as the spinocerebellum. Okay, they get a lot of the uh, information from the um, uh, spinal cord and are very important in terms of coordinating midline truncal mus musculature like they're involved in walking and balance. So if the anterior lobe or the vermis is affected, then the patient typically going to have a significant gait ataxia. As we move out more laterally, the posterior lobe, which is you know, most, most of the lateral hemispheres, is called the cerebrocerebellum because most of this, a lot of it, is dedicated to that output back to your motor cortex, and this tends to be most of the posterior lobe dedicated more to the very fine technical movements like you know playing a piano or an instrument, handwriting, typing, um, that kind of thing. The flocculonodular lobe is sometimes re referred to as the vestibulocerebellum because it's very important for eye movements. So if we have a lesion there, the patient will have nystagmus or some eye movement abnormality. And anything that involves the vestibular apparatus, whether it's in the inner ear, the vestibular nuclei, or the flocculonodular lobe, it, if we disrupt that vestibular circuitry, patients are going to have vertigo, okay? And it's hard to walk if you have vertigo. So sort of like a lesion of the vermis here, they're going to have a, a gait ataxia as well. Okay, so just a few drawings here. In green, we can see the posterior lobe. Um, here's the vermis, which, you know, does involve, uh, I think this kind of underrepresents how much of the anterior lobe is made up of the vermis. But here's the anterior lobe with the vermis, a large port of that. And then we have the flocculus and the nodule. So this is the flocculonodular lobe. Okay, and another rep representation. I like this one because it shows how much of the vermis here makes up the anterior lobe, very large posterior lobe, and the flocculonodular lobe. Um, we also think of the cerebellum in terms of these zones. So you have a vermis. As we move out laterally, this is referred to as the paravermis. Okay, and then we have the lateral hemisphere um, of the brain. And so basically, the more midline something is in the cerebellum, it coordinates more midline musculature. The further laterally we go in the cerebellum, the more it coordinates more distal musculature. So if you were asked, you know, what's the function of this part of the cerebellum, you'd want to pick a, a very fine motor task um, you know, using tools, typing, playing an instrument, something like that. Um, and this would be more related to walking and balance, and the flocculonodular lobe more with, uh, as it relates to uh, eye movements. Okay, so let's put a little more details on this. The vermis, which um, kind of overlaps in function here with the flocculonodular lobe, we have these cells in the cerebellar cortex, really the only cells that I'm going to ask you to know are the Purkinje cells. Um, all of the output of the cerebellum, once all of this magical processing occurs, is via Purkinje cells. And so Purkinje cells in the vermis, 
project to the vestigial nucleus. Okay, that, remember that's the midline deep cerebellar nucleus. And then to the nuclei, reticulospinal and vestibular, that become these upper motor neuron pathways. We talked about in the spinal cord lecture, the reticulospinal tract and the vestibulospinal tract. The big point is, do you remember that these involve truncal midline musculature? So when we say the vermis coordinates truncal midline musculature, this is how it happens. It talks to these upper motor neurons in the brainstem that activate upper motor neuron pathways that are important for midline truncal musculature. Okay, so that's the vermis. Also, especially the follicular nodular lobe is involved with the vestibular system um, as well and coordinating how your eyes move. As we move out more laterally, the paravermis, uh, we have Purkinje cells now that talk, you know, we again just think we're moving out laterally, so they move out to the next two deep cerebellar nuclei, which is a globose and emboliform. Okay, a lot of this goes to the red nucleus and um, then some of it can also go up to the motor cortex um, of the brain. Okay, as we move out more laterally, and, and just remember that, you know, here we are influencing another upper motor neuron pathway, the rubrospinal tract, which originates from the red nucleus. Okay, so we have here the flocular nodular lobe and the vestigial nucleus, and so this is going to influence the vestibular nucleus and the vestibulospinal tract. Um, not shown here is the reticulospinal tract, but that would also be um, involved here. And then we have output from the cerebellum here, mainly globose and emboliform, that goes to the red nucleus. Okay, and that influences here in yellow the rubrospinal tract. Again, influences another upper motor neuron pathway. Okay. And as we move up very laterally into the posterior uh, lateral hemisphere, posterior lobe lateral hemisphere, the, via the dentate nucleus, this goes back mostly entirely to the opposite motor cortex. Okay, so again, from the lateral hemispheres, it's Purkinje cells to the dentate nucleus via VL of the thalamus to the contralateral motor cortex. Okay, and that is this one. The thalamic relay nucleus is not shown here, just to kind of give you the big picture. All right, so that's why the lateral hemispheres, we say, are involved more of the cerebellum with fine dexterous movement, because this is going to strongly influence the cortical spinal tract. And remember, slightly more than half of your cortical spinal tract just goes down to anterior horn cells in the cervical cord, which are involved in very fine, delicate hand movements. Okay, now let's talk about the inputs from the cerebellum. And I have highlighted in yellow really all that I will ask you from this um, table. So every movement, okay, is activated or activates either muscle spindles or Golgi tendon organs. Okay, this is the input that the cerebellum is going to get, the activation from those muscle spindles or Golgi tendon organs. Below T6, it's the dorsal and the ventral spinocerebellar tract. Well, I do expect you to know that. That's from our spinal cord lecture. So I didn't put it in yellow, but you should know below T6, it's dorsal and ventral spinocerebellar tract. The names for above T6 are the cuneo cerebellar tract and the rostro cerebellar tract. Um, I won't ask you that. Okay, but you should know the names of the pathways below T6 for the legs. Okay, so these get to the cerebellum very quickly via either 1A or 1B. Again, I think that's a detail you don't need to know. Um, because we did talk about this in the spinal cord lecture, and sometimes this is shown up on boards, uh, the only relay nucleus I'd like you to know is Clark's nucleus, which remember we saw uh, from T1 to L2 in the thoracic cord mainly, so this is the relay nucleus for the dorsal spinocerebellar tract. Remember, three of the four spinocerebellar pathways go through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Um, the ventral spinocerebellar tract is the oddball pathway because it crosses twice in the spinal cord and it gets into the cerebellum when it crosses the second time in the superior cerebellar peduncle. 
right? So that's how the cerebellum gets information about what's actually happening with regards to movement. And this is uh, sometimes referred to as unconscious proprioception. Conscious proprioception is that information going up through the posterior columns and the medial lemniscus. You know, I am now aware of where my foot is in space. That's posterior columns, medial lemniscus. Unconscious proprioception is the information about you know, the position of your arms and legs, but it's going to the cerebellum so that it can automatically communicate with the motor cortex um, to smooth out movement. But that's not a conscious processing. This is an automatic circuit that doesn't involve um, you know, conscious awareness. So we call it unconscious proprioception. Okay, I thought this was an old drawing here, but just to kind of show you these deep cerebellar nuclei. Remember from lateral, dentate, emboliform, globose, and vestigial, midline. So really, I will just be repeating everything that I said, but now just to emphasize the deep cerebellar nuclei. And here it is in the brainstem section. We went over dentate, emboliform, globose, vestigial. And there is the nodulus. So remember the floccular nodular lobe communicates with the vestigial nucleus, which is right here. Okay, so starting with the vermis and the floccular nodular lobe, we said this coordinates truncal midline musculature via the vestib vestibular ret reticulospinal nuclei, which then control the vestibulospinal tract and the reticulospinal tract. Okay, this communication occurs through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. The nucleus is the vestigial nucleus. As we move out more laterally into the paravermis, okay, Purkinje cells here communicate via the globose and emboliform, mainly to the contralateral red nucleus. This goes through the superior cerebellar peduncle to influence the rubrospinal tract. And then as we move out into the lateral hemisphere, um, remember this is a very distal fine movement okay, that is going to the opposite motor cortex. Um, and I, I should say here that uh, this is the dentate. Um, there it is, <laughs> the dentate nucleus. So the dentate nucleus you want to associate with the lateral hemisphere, very fine movement. Okay, and also um, this is involved in motor planning. So if you have played an instrument, for example, the piano, and you just, you know, you can do a run with the piano up and down the chord, and after you've practiced that a few hundred times, it comes automatically. A lot of that program lies in the cerebellum that allows you just to kind of plug in and that movement happens automatically. And there is even a cognitive function here of the lateral hemisphere that isn't very well um, understood. All right, so um, just to show you a nice picture here, a medical student drew recently, here's the vermis and the floccular nodular lobe. So remember the deep cerebellar nucleus involved there is the vestigial nucleus. And here it is in, uh, activating these um, vestibular and reticular nuclei, which then activate the reticulospinal vestibulospinal tracts, which activate midline truncal musculature. This is the only drawing I could find um, here of the globose and emboliform. So here the cerebellum in green are the globose and emboliform nuclei, and this is going up to the red nucleus to influence the um, the rubrospinal tract here. Okay, and the dentate, so Purkinje cells here communicate with the dentate nucleus, and so this goes through the superior cerebellar peduncle to the VL of the thalamus. VL is the only one I want you to know, that's the main one, and then to the opposite motor cortex. Okay, and now we'll repeat everything again with respect to the cerebellar peduncles. So when you think of the superior cerebellar peduncle, it's mainly output. All of that information from the cerebellum out to the VL and the motor cortex and to the red nucleus is through the superior cerebellar peduncle. Okay, um, the only pathway, there is another, but the only one I'm going to tell you about that goes in through the superior cerebellar peduncle is the ventral spinal cerebellar tract. Remember the one that crosses twice. Middle cerebellar peduncle is easy, just one pathway that goes through the middle cerebellar peduncle, the cortical pontocerebellar tract that we've talked about a lot.
the inferior cerebellar peduncle is uh, predominantly um, information going into the cerebellum, remember three of the four spinocerebellar tracts, but the vestibular nuclei, um, this input um, goes back and forth from the cerebellum to the vestibular nuclei and vice versa. And the inferior olivary nuclei communicate through the inferior cerebellar peduncles via what are called climbing fibers. And I don't know why that is so often. I've seen a board question in the past, um, but you should relate climbing fibers to the inferior olivary nucleus. So here's a section um, here of the medulla when we talked about lateral medullary syndrome. Here's the inferior cerebellar peduncle. There is the inferior olive. Okay, so the inferior olive communicates to the cerebellum through the inferior cerebellar peduncle, and these are the climbing fibers. Uh, I will tell you in just a little bit, this is a very powerful, excitatory pathway going into the cerebellum. Okay, we have these vestibular nuclei here, and the vestibular nuclei, we have information shared back and forth between the vestibular nuclei and the cerebellum, but all of that is happening here through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Okay, so climbing fibers only refer to information from the inferior olive going to the cerebellum. Everything else, anything else that goes into the cerebellum, we call mossy fibers. Now, we used to have a whole um, hour-long lecture on the cerebellar cortex. It's really complex to understand all of this. And I had a light bulb moment about six or seven years ago when uh, I was giving a lecture to our neurology residents on this. And um, I realized that there wasn't one neurologist in the room, and there were about 10 or 11 there, that really remembered much, if anything, about this. And so I thought this is too detailed for medical students to know. <laughs> so I'm only going to ask you to know three things about the cerebellar cortex. I think this is more of a PhD, um, you know, kind of a thing. And so there are three layers of the cerebellar cortex. We have a molecular layer out here, a Purkinje cell layer, which I'm sorry is not labeled um, on the diagram in your handout, but I typed it out here, where the Purkinje cells here are located. And then we have a granular layer, okay, which contains a huge number of um, um, cells here. The medullary layer is just white matter. So these are the three main layers um, here of the cerebellar cortex. And so here's what I want you to know. So Purkinje cells get very strong excitatory input, as I mentioned, from the inferior olivary nucleus. So here's a climbing fiber. So if you want, you can just kind of draw the inferior olivary nucleus right here. And so the inferior olive, via these climbing fibers, which remember go through the inferior cerebellar peduncle, um, are, have a very powerful effect here on these Purkinje cells. It's excitatory, it's glutamate. And this seems to be really important here for motor learning, this connection between the inferior olive and the um, Purkinje cells. Okay, so that's one point. Remember, everything else going into the cerebellum we're going to call mossy fibers. Okay, and then the other point I'd like you to know is that all of this processing happens in the cerebellum, and we won't go through how that works, but all of the output from the cerebellum is via the Purkinje cells, and this is inhibitory, so it's GABA on the deep cerebe cerebellar nucleus and also on the vestibular nuclei. Okay, so this is a very busy slide, and I'm just going to point out a couple of things. So here we have the inferior olive sending Climbing fibers up here to excite Purkinje cells. Um, everything else going in are mossy fibers. Everything out of the cerebellum is via the Purkinje cells, and this is GABAergic, inhibitory, on the deep cerebellar nuclei and also on the vestibular nuclei. Okay, now finally, just to come back to this connection here between the red nucleus, inferior olive, and the cerebellum. This is called Mollerae's triangle. So the things that are important here, first just to recognize that the red nucleus has a role to play in terms of cerebellar circuitry. 
Okay, remember that a lesion of the central tegmental tract will give the patient palatal myoclonus. Okay, remember also, you know, that the fibers here from the inferior olive to the cerebellum are um, climbing fibers. And the one thing that I think is actually inaccurate here, it's the globose and vestigial that mainly communicate with the red nucleus here. There may be a little bit from the dentate, but this is Mollerae's triangle. And so remember that the palatal myoclonus can occur with a lesion there. Now let's talk about some clinical um, relationships here based on this neuroanatomy. So we haven't had our neuroradiology lectures yet, but you're only allowed to have two things that are bright on a CT scan. One is calcium. So we have the calcified skull. Of course, that's normal. But the only other thing that's allowed to be bright other than calcium is acute hemorrhage. And so what we're seeing here is a bleed in the cerebellum. Okay, now when we look at an MRI or a CT scan, um, so this is a CT, um, you always want to remember the patient's lying on their back, feet coming out towards you. So this is a hemorrhage in the left cerebellar hemisphere. Some of the blood we can see here has gone into the fourth ventricle. Here's the pons. So this is all the cerebellum. So this is a cerebellar hemorrhage. And so... Based on what we've gone over, what exam findings would this patient have? Well, uh, remember that this half of the cerebellum ultimately gets information from the same arm and leg, ipsilateral, to communicate with the opposite motor cortex, which moves the opposite side of the body. So if we have a lesion of one half of the cerebellum, the ataxia is going to be on the same side. It's ipsilateral. Okay, most things it seems like in neurology are crossed, but with cerebellar lesions, we have ipsilateral ataxia. And so uh, with a cerebellar stroke or hemorrhage, we get ipsilateral ataxia. Okay, so that helps us to localize the lesion. Also, um, Remember, the cerebellum communicates with these upper motor neuron nuclei in the brainstem, like the reticular and vestibular nuclei. And so when you distort the um, output to those nuclei, we can have less muscle tone. So we can get ipsilateral hypotonia, where there's just less tone on that side of the body. Um, quite honestly, I have checked for this on multiple cerebellar strokes and hemorrhages and um, it's really hard to appreciate, and most of the time I don't, but you still should know it for probably board purposes. And along with that, you may have what are known as pendular reflexes. So imagine we're checking the patellar reflex on the same side of this cerebellar hemorrhage. Um, because there's less tone, the leg may kick out and it may just kind of swing back and forth like a pendulum for a little bit because of the decreased tone. Now, nystagmus can occur because uh, if we involve the follicular nodular lobe, and just look at this bleed here, it's quite midline, you know, including hemorrhage into the fourth ventricle. So we would expect this patient to have some nystagmus. Dysdiadokinesia refers to difficulty maintaining a regular rhythm. So like having a patient quickly tap their thumb and index finger together, or to tap with their hand on their thigh, alternating palm and back of the hand. Do that as fast as they can. And if you have a cerebellar lesion, that's really hard to do on the same side. And when they're reaching for objects, they'll often have some shaking as well on the ipsilateral side. I should put ipsilateral um, here by action tremors and the dysdiadokinesia. So acutely, this is what we would see with a cerebellar stroke or hemorrhage. Now, chronic alcoholism essentially pickles the cerebellum. And so we can see here the normal cerebellum looking healthy here in this sagittal uh, MRI. And notice all of the black around it here. This is because the, the cerebellum is just atrophied away. And so there's just fluid space. Now we can you know make out these folia much better because of all the atrophy. So alcohol pickles the cerebellum, but especially the anterior lobe and the vermis. And remember, that's important for midline truncal musculature. And so that's why alcoholics tend to have not so much distal extremity ataxia, but truncal midline ataxia. 
A medication that we will talk about soon once we get to epilepsy is called phenytoin. Okay, for this course, you just need to know the generics. So phenytoin is what you need to know, but I include dilantin here because when you get into the third year, everyone's going to be talking about dilantin. Boards will ask you phenytoin. But this is a seizure medication where patients easily get toxic on this medication. It's very easy for blood levels to go high. And that prominent, predominantly affects the cerebellum. And so patients have ataxia and nystagmus from these cerebellar dysfunction. Patients feel drunk and feel like they're, you know, falling very easily. Now, a relatively common childhood brain tumor makes up about 25% of childhood tumors is called a medulloblastoma. Dr. Deich will go over this in a lot more detail, so this is kind of an introduction to this. But this tends to be a midline uh, brainstem tumor that occurs in the first 10 years of life. And because it's midline, it easily affects the flow of CSF, like through the cerebral aqueduct, through the fourth ventricle. And so uh, what we're actually seeing here is obviously the mass, but look at the big third ventricle and the lateral ventricle. So we have a non-communicating hydrocephalus um, here, which uh, occurs early in a medulloblastoma. And so remember signs of increased intracranial pressure. We may have a Cushing's reflex with a high systolic blood pressure um, and a low heart rate. Um, this patient, boy or girl, would likely complain of headache, nausea, vomiting. Recall that increased intracranial pressure often gives you a bilateral sixth nerve palsy. So there are a lot of clues that, um, that we can see you know, in, in this child coming into the emergency room that suggests this really is an emergency. Um, because the tumor tends to be midline, it tends to involve more of the vermis and the flocculonodular lobe. So the ataxia, sort of like alcoholism, tends to be more of a wide-based gait um, unsteadiness. And we would also expect to see nystagmus as well from the flocculonodular lobe involvement. All right, and I just read a UWorld uh, question on this condition, and that is perineoplastic cerebellar degeneration. Perineoplastic refers to the indirect effect of cancer um, on the nervous system. And so the cancer is not in the cerebellum, but the immune system kind of is a dysregulated response to the cancer, which can be ovarian, breast, small cell, cancer of the lung, ends up attacking the Purkinje cells, so the cerebellum. And so the UWorld question, I think, was a patient who was having progressive ataxia, and you were told that the brain scan was normal, uh, what would be the cause? And the answer was uh, perineoplastic. So what we look for here is uh, there are specific anti-Purkinje cell antibodies that we can diagnose this on a blood test. And once we've diagnosed it, then obviously you search for the cancer, but oftentimes, oftentimes the ataxia will come on before the patient is known to have cancer. Okay, and then finally we have Friedrich's ataxia, a very common national board question. This is a devastating condition that with onset in um, young children or teenage years, autosomal recessive, and this is the first of three conditions that we will talk about in this course that are trinucleotide repeat disorders. And that often is kind of what the question comes down to. Can you recognize it? And then remember that it's a trinucleotide repeat so this is uh, GAA repeats on chromosome number 9. So we can diagnose this uh, by a simple, very expensive blood test. So the reason Friedrich's ataxia is so um, devastating is that so much of the nervous system degenerates. We have atrophy of the spinocerebellar tracts. So patients have ataxia from the involvement there. Uh, the peripheral nerves degenerate, so we get a peripheral neuropathy. We have posterior column degeneration, so patients will have a loss of proprioception, vibration, and there's some cortical spinal tract degeneration, so there may be some upper motor neuron findings and some spasticity. So all four of these together are going to contribute to very unsteady walking, and so falling, progressive gait instability is a very prominent feature along with ataxia. And, of course, they'll have a loss of vibration, proprioception, some upper motor neuron findings. And, um, you know, so this is a relentlessly progressive condition. 
So here's a spinal cord of the patient with Friedreich's ataxia. So normal color here, myelination of the spinal cord is here. So you can see significant degeneration of the posterior columns and of the dorsal and ventral spinocerebellar tracts here, and also some of the corticospinal tract here in this location.